Welcome back to another Post Media Ottawa Senators panel. I'm Bruce Garriock, pleased to be joined today by Sens play-by-play -play voice on TSN 1200, uh, Dean Brown. And uh, let's start out today by, first of all, Dean offering our condolences to Anna and Olivia Melnick at the loss of their father, Eugene Melnick, who uh, saved this team out of bankruptcy in 2003, his, his mother, Vera, and his longtime partner, Sherry Lynn Anderson. And... Uh, you know, uh, not many people knew that Eugene was ill. Uh, he was an intensely private man that way, but we're certainly thinking of uh, him and his family today. Uh, Dean, I, 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 let's start with, with, you, with Eugene. And what do you think his legacy will be in Ottawa? Well, I, th I think pretty clearly, Bruce, uh, the legacy is going to be that he saved the team. Uh, you, know, the, you know, there are some facts that you, uh, you just can't get around. You know, the fact is that if he wouldn't have bought the team, the team would have died or moved or both. Um, the fact is that, uh, you know, if he had not bought the team, I, I think it's some around $120 million has been raised for local charities. Uh, that's because of this team. Uh, you know, if you look at the thousands of people, a thousand people who work at the building, but the thousands around it um, who work at it or supply things to it, uh, it's created jobs, Stittsville, Canada. And the city of Ottawa certainly would not be anywhere close to the same if it weren't for Eugene Melnick. So I, I think at these times, you know, if you look at things on the whole, nobody is pretending that he didn't have a turbulent relationship, uh, you know, at times with the fan base, with the mayor, with the city, with, you know, um, no one's denying those things. But I think, you know, now, you know, the passing of, of someone who has been an important builder in this town, I think it's fair and the right thing to do is to you know, out of respect for the family and respect for the man, concentrate on the positives and the things that he did that were impactful for the city. And there are a great many of them. And there'll be plenty of time for people who choose to do that to evaluate his relationship with the fan base or the city or whatever. And there's lots of time to, you know, to review that in the future sometime. But I think now is the time to think about the things that he created. And he, he created a great deal for our city. Well, and, and you look at that, Dean, and, uh, you know, we both were fortunate to have the opportunity uh, to, to spend a lot of time with Eugene Melnick. You did some town halls with him. Um, I, I think that, that sometimes people forget, Dean, that as much as Eugene Melnick signed the checks for this team, he was, by and large, its biggest fan. I mean, you know, I, I, I was kind of thinking about how you know, he 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 just wanted them to win, and and, and he he just and nothing else mattered to him really. And and you know, he was as passionate as any fan out there. I think. Yeah, for sure. There's no question. He, you know, like he was very emotional, and he was very very you know um, passionate about this team, about this game. And uh, Lord knows, uh, you know, when he bought this team, he probably had better things to do with $130 million, you know. At the time, uh, you know, BioVail was uh, still a, a going concern. He had uh, a lot of people, you know, who were looking to him to invest in different things. He had uh, lots of opportunities and uh, lots of ability to do that. But uh, like I said, this probably wasn't the best business decision, as uh, Mr. Bryden and Mr. Firestone before him can attest. But he just loved it. It was an emotional thing. Yeah. It was a passion thing. And uh, that really shone through every day with him. You know, um, sometimes he really did. You know, he didn't behave like an owner. He behaved like a fan because uh, at his base, he was. He was very much a fan yeah. of this team, fan of this game, fan of the players, coaches. He just he was very much a fan. You know, I. I find it interesting, Dean, that uh, at, at times like these, people want answers right away. And, sure. and and now they want to know what's going to happen with the ownership of this team. None of us know, Dean. Uh, I'm going to prof profess that by saying what I can tell you is what he told me in 2017 was that he had, quote, set this team up to be in his family for generations. Really, and this is this is not the time, and I don't want, know why people want answers, but the future of this franchise, and whether it's sold or kept in the family, will be up to his young daughters, Anna and Olivia. But Anna's 25 years old, just graduated from UCLA. Olivia's 20, 19 or 20, just uh, in the second year of university at Queen's University. Uh, I think she's in a Bachelor of Arts. Um, she has interned in the front office during the summers, uh, 
to get a look at the operation. I, I think there's certainly interest on on both both of his children's part to keep the franchise in the family, but they don't have to make that decision now, Deed. Do they? Yeah. No. No, no, they they don't. And I'm like you, I, I don't know what the path ahead is. And you're right, nobody does. Um, so uh, I look at this and I understand the human nature is what's next. But but I also uh, have hope that uh, those things wouldn't override what is most important right now. And that's the fact that there's a family grieving. Um, I, I understand that uh, it's a hockey team and, uh, you know, the, the ownership of it is an important thing for fans to know where everything's going. But I think right now is the time when you have to consider the fact that no one is withholding any information. A family's grieving. That's what they're yeah. doing right now. They're not having board meetings, uh, you know. So I think there's nothing wrong or nefarious with letting the family grieve a, a pretty substantial loss. But, you know, going forward, you know, there's lots of things that are out there. And, you know, I, I understand people's want and desire to be first with things. And, and I and I get that. I, I do. But I just, you know, when I, when I hear... Uh, you know, people recounting that uh, I've heard there's two groups, there's three groups interested, there's four groups interested. I can tell you one thing that I do know for sure, and I've talked with Bill Daly about this a couple of times over the years. There's always two, three, four, six, ten groups that are interested in buying any NHL team, not just the Ottawa Senators. So for me, when I, I hear stories like that, to me, it's not even news. Uh, you know, it's it's like uh, putting on your newspaper each day that the sun is coming up. Well, well yes, it is. You know, in Ottawa, an, a, a, an NHL team may be for sale. Yeah, there are people interested. There are always people interested. The, the commissioner and the league have a list of people who have already gone through the process of proving to the league that they have the wherewithal to be an owner if a team should ever come up or a position in ownership. So, you know, that that goes on every day. That's not a today thing. That's an everyday thing. So it's it's really, to me, not not really news. The news will be, and the and the scoop will be, um, when and if um, the daughters decide that they want to do something. As you mentioned, you know, I, I was there too in Sweden. I, I remember standing out, outside the, the bar in the hotel we were staying at in Sweden because there was a, a league event going on. And, and, and you know, Eugene Melnick uh, told all of us, you know, I'm not going to live forever. And there's a transition plan and it, it, yeah. would, it would make it feasible for my family to own this team forever. So, um, you know, people who think there's not a plan, there is a plan. A plan was set a long time ago, Bruce, and I know you've you've said and written that, and I was there. That's that's true. Um, but I think it only becomes a story when uh, the daughters decide what they want to do. In the meantime, there's a a four person board uh, that was long ago established to run this team, and so uh, they will advise and they will you know help the the daughters through this process whichever road they choose to take to sell it or to keep on owning it or to run it for a while and then decide or have the board uh, just continue to run it infinitum that, that you know every, everybody knows who Sheldon Planner is he's been you know Mr. Melnick's yes, right hand man absolutely. for 25 years you know and so it's not like you have somebody in there that doesn't know what's going on he's the chairman of this board but i i think that this this rush to find new owners is kind of cart before the horse it's, it's really and, not anything that's real until there's a, a decision on whether the team will be sold. And so I, I, I got to be honest with you, Bruce, I don't pay much attention to it at all because no. it's not really a thing until there's a decision on whether it's run it or sell it. Yeah, and I, 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 you're right. I find this discussion uh, tasteless and classless. But um, one of the things that happened, Dean, was a, a story out of Quebec City that was clearly leaked by somebody who doesn't want it to happen, uh, suggested that uh, the Quebec government is in talk with the Senators for five games next season. It was uh, the Senators are, in fact, in a discussion with Quebec or in the Quebec City government and the, and pardon me, the Quebec government about the possibility of hosting the 2023 World Junior Championship uh, that they, they're putting in a bid with Hockey Canada. They looked at the Slush Puppy Centre in Gatineau, said it's not big enough. Uh, I think TD Place has its own issues. Uh, they, they feel like this would be a good scenario. Um, the timing of that story was very bad. The, uh, but I do think that Anthony LeBlanc tried to put as much water on that fire as he could. And I, I thought he did a good job yesterday. 
Again, you know, I've, I've had a couple of people ask me about uh, about the, the five game Quebec thing. And, you know, I, I've said the same thing. I don't know. Uh, and, and the other thing that I said. Neither do I. Kind of kind of in the same vein, uh, Bruce, as as the uh, the interested parties who would be looking to buy any NHL franchise. Um, and until until this is explained as a thing, it's hard to describe what the thing is. But what we do yeah. know, because the group that is in Quebec City has been trying to get a franchise back, has made it very clear to anybody and everybody for many years, they want to have any kind of NHL games at any time in their building. So the fact that they would be interested in a five game segment is no news to anybody. Yes, they would be interested in five games of Ottawa games, of Arizona games, of some Montreal games, of anybody's games if they would bring them to Quebec. That I, that is certain. Um, whether Ottawa is actually in negotiations to play five of their regular season games in Quebec City, um, I have no idea, but I doubt it. But who knows, maybe. But I, I think the idea that this just sprung up is also, uh, like I said, I, you know, they have made it very clear that they've been in negotiations with the league, contacting the league, uh, trying to get any games there, preseason, regular season, any games there for quite some time. So um, implying that these things are hotter than they are right now as far as a topic may be a stretch. I would want to know what, if anything, is actually going on before I had a comment on how good or bad that would be for the Ottawa Senators. Because right now, um, I don't, I haven't seen anything where anybody knows exactly what this is or if it's even a thing. So until it's a thing, I don't know what I think about it. Last topic for me uh, today, and I would like to talk a, a little bit about hockey. You're in Detroit with the team as we speak here, Dean. One of the things you do before every Senators game on TSN 1200 is is you have your segment where you talk about a prospect. And one of the prospects yep. that we're going to see that I think the people are very excited about either Friday night or in Detroit or Sunday afternoon here at home is goaltender Mad Sogard. What can you tell us about uh, Mad Sogard? Well, I can tell you that he's super tall. He's, <laughs> he's, uh, he's, six, foot seven. he's six foot seven, maybe. He, he might be, I'll tell you a great little story. He's, he's six foot seven, maybe. So when he was at his first development camp, I go, as you know, Bruce, I go and I um, absolutely yeah. interview. Players. I go and ask them specifically, how do you want your name pronounced in the NHL? And I record them saying it so that when I'm pronouncing their names, I do it as closely as I can to the way they want them pronounced. And that's why oftentimes also you'll hear me on the air calling a player a name differently from what some other broadcasters do. Um, but I go by what the player, how he wants his name pronounced, not how others have pronounced it in the past. But anyway, um, when I talked to Matt Sogard, when I was doing that, I said, now in one publication, they listed you at six foot seven and another one listed you at six foot eight. So which are you? And he said, uh, go with six foot seven. Do you use, use six foot seven? And I said, well, are you six foot seven? He said, listen, six foot seven sounds tall. Six foot eight sounds freakish. So go with six foot seven. So I, don't, I don't actually know what the problem that Sogard is, but I say I say six foot seven because he thinks six foot eight is freakish. So I have a feeling he is actually six foot eight, but it just doesn't oh, sound right. So he wants to go awesome. with six foot seven. So I go with six foot seven. I can tell you one thing the we one thing we do know, Dean. One thing we do know, he covers a yeah. lot of the net, and and that's what we <laughs> hope to see this weekend, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think so. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, you know, DJ Smith said he's going to play while he's up here. So uh, it's either going to be uh, Friday here in Detroit or it's going to be Sunday at home. If I'm betting, Bruce, I'm betting that it's probably going to be Friday here in Detroit simply because okay. Sunday is going to be a very big crowd in Ottawa. There's going to be a, a longer than normal delay because there's certainly going to be a ceremony for the passing of Mr. Melnick. And I'm just not sure with a, a young goaltender playing his first NHL game, you want him standing around in, you know, during the ceremony and all the delays and his mind will be rolling. And, you know, so I think it's probably a better idea uh, for him to play f his first NHL game Friday in Detroit. But when they make that decision, uh, you know, we'll bring it to you. But um, I, I, when, when you get to see him, it's going to be interesting because uh, I think right now, um, I think that, uh, I think that Gustafson has, I'm not, I'm not sure taking a step back. He just, I don't think he's taken as many steps forward, as many steps forward as they thought he would. I think he's kind of stalled a bit in his progression at the same time that Matt Sogard continues to rise and surge. And I'm not saying that in the, in the progression chart that Matt Sogard has passed him on the depth chart of this team, 
But if he hasn't, he's pretty close. And so um, I, I think that's a real interesting thing for this team because I think it's just been, you know, for two years now, kind of been the thought that, you know, um, within a year, um, you know, Philip Gustafson will be the backup goalie in Ottawa. I'm not sure that's written in stone anymore. And these next game or two or how many Sogard gets, I think is going to be a, a big indicator of where he is. Well, Dean, we appreciate your time today. And uh, before we wrap up, thanks again to Dean Brown, play-by-play -play voice of the Ottawa Senators on TSN 1200. I'm Bruce Garriock for Post Media in Ottawa. And again, our thoughts go out to Eugene Melnick's family.